very nicely said it at the end. Thank you. Uh, and I just wanted to say that uh, I leave it open to is there any, the way you put the Eisenhower legacy at the end, I assume that that's how you wanted to wrap it. But is there anything else you wanted to say as long as we have the camera rolling? I'm, I have a particular supplementary from my own point of view, Mr. President, and that is I wonder whether there's any other anecdote you recall, something which the President may have said to you, uh, perhaps at that time in confidence with Jimmy Chambers, now which in some way encapsulated the character of the man. Give us right. a couple of hints of that. You mentioned the steely blue eyes behind the charming smile. <laughs> moments, perhaps, that you can recall when mm -hmm. you thought, yes, I see. Let's that. see. Let's see. I was particularly thinking perhaps at the time when you had had the, um, uh, the famous debates with Khrushchev in the exhibition in Moscow, when you came perhaps to talk with the president after that, particularly in the last uh, two or three years, perhaps, mm. of the administration. Mm. Is this something which mm. comes to your mind? So, something which will give us a quick pen and ink sketch. Let's see, sort decisive. of a feel. I don't know. I mean, let me just think a minute and see. Uh, there are many I could think of. that I can I think of at the moment. Uh, well, perhaps in the early days of uh, yeah. the campaign, the election, the, the, the early days of coming into the White House mm -hmm. and the uh, early... Let's see. Perhaps put even as a more general thing, his, his yeah. astonishing appeal worldwide. I mean, when he, he finally is his almost victory parades during the last year of his presidency, his visits When to he traveled around, yeah. Yes, but the mm -hmm. sense of, you know, what was that like magic, something of a more personal nature, as you mm -hmm. remained such a, to myself, of being youngish in England at the time. He was yeah, a, I have a, I have a, yeah, I do have one that involved Johnson. This will be interesting. But it's something else that's a, about the secret of, uh, I mean, uh, how, uh, how Eisenhower did so well with the Soviets and why. Okay. okay. Fine. Yeah. I'm sometimes asked, no, I strike that. Let me think of a better put it. I think most people are aware of the fact that during the eight years that Eisenhower was president, that he not only ended the war in Korea, but that he kept the peace for eight years. Uh, and that in spite of the fact that this was a period when the Chinese were still in an expansionist phase. It was a period also when the Soviet Union was in certainly an expansionist phase. Uh, we had no relations with the Chinese, of course, at all in that period. Uh, we did have relations with the Soviet. Uh, President Eisenhower tried as much as he possibly could to follow the advice of some well-intentioned advisors who said, if, if you can only convince Khrushchev you're for peace, then Khrushchev then will not fear us and we will be able to work out uh, a live and let live arrangement. And uh, I remember that before I went to Moscow in 1959, I talked to John Foster Dulles. Dulles was dying of cancer. I called on him out at the hospital. And uh, I was trying to get advice as to what I should say to Khrushchev. What should I try to get across? And he said, you do not have to convince him that we are for peace. He knows that. You must convince him that he cannot win a war. Years later, in 1969, uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, came to have breakfast with me at the White House. And he was looking back at the very painful experience he'd had in Vietnam. He had called bombing halts during the Vietnam War. And uh, he said, I remember that Harriman told me at least 12 times that if we just call a bombing halt, that the Soviets would lean on the North Vietnamese 
and the Viet Cong, and they would stop shelling the cities. He said, every one of the bombing halls was a mistake. I should never have called any of them because they misinterpreted it. And then for some reason, Johnson then immediately digressed to Eisenhower. He said, let me tell you why Eisenhower, or he called him Ike. I never called him Ike, incidentally. Uh, in our, it's an interesting observation. Uh, it's most people in the media call him Ike, and he, he didn't mind that a bit. But it, in that cabinet, uh, among his associates and so forth, the only one that called him Ike was his very close friend and contemporary, uh, George Humphrey, the Secretary of the Treasury. All of the rest of us called him Mr. President. And I called him Mr. President for the rest of his life and general after he left the presidency because he wanted to be called general rather than Mr. President at that point. He was very formal in that respect, incidentally. But I recall that, that Eisenhower uh, in that uh, period of time, what's like that? Uh, get, coming back to John, uh, when uh, Johnson was trying to explain to me, he said, let me tell you why, John, why Eisenhower, let's try to start again so you can get a good clip here. After discussing the failure of the bombing halts, halt, no, that's right. No, after discussing the failure of the bombing halts and saying that they were all a mistake, he then began to talk about Soviet American relations. And he took a very dim view at that point, even though he'd had the Glassboro experience, where they had the spirit of Glassboro, which lasted only 24 hours. Uh, Johnson said, Eisenhower got along well with the Russians. He said, you know why? Not because they liked him, but because they feared him. Eisenhower was the man that had commanded the victorious armies in Europe. And the Russians feared Ike. And as long as they feared Ike, they weren't going to mess with him. And that was why that when Eisenhower in 1956, when there was a crisis in the Mideast, uh, or during the Berlin crises that developed during the time he was president, or in 1958 when he went into Lebanon, uh, the Russians did not test him because they feared him. I am not suggesting here that the only way you can have a relationship with the Russians today is that they must fear us. But I am suggesting that as far as one of the great politicians of our time, who spoke from experience, Lyndon Johnson, I think was very close to the truth when he recognized that as far as the Soviets were concerned during the Eisenhower period, it was not simply America's strength that impressed them. It was not simply America's wealth that impressed them, but it was the fact that America was led by the man who had commanded the greatest forces in history in Europe, Dwight Eisenhower, and they felt that that, uh, and they felt, and consequently, because he had that reputation, they realized that behind that smile was a very tough-minded man. And I would say in that connection, ending the Korean War, perhaps, bears on that. Uh, many people forget that uh, the Korean War was still going on when President Eisenhower became president. In fact, during the campaign, he said, I will go to Korea. And he went to Korea. The war didn't end then. And the war ended in about six months or so. And it ended because John Foster Dulles was able to convey through the Indian ambassador to the North Koreans that the United States was considering the use of nuclear weapons. And that, of course, was conveyed also to the Soviet Union and to the Chinese. Now, whether they thought that might happen or not is not the point. They had, however, to fear that Eisenhower, the man with this enormous military reputation, was one they shouldn't mess with, that he just might do it. So the fact, so it's very important that when we're talking about a president of the United States who leads the free world, and then and now, that he should be respected, yes, that people should be convinced that he is for peace, yes. But they also must recognize that he is one that if they push him too far, he not only has the means, but he will have the will to use military force. And that, of course, is the lesson that George Bush applied so well in the recent difficulties in the Gulf. And it worked.
And that means, and that means that in the future, incidentally, I think a point that should be made. Before George Bush, uh, after uh, his masterful handling of the situation with the United Nations and with the coalition and with the Congress and so forth, before he uh, was able to uh, uh, lead the forces to victory in which a number, well, let me, let me put this, I'll, I'm gonna shorten that down. Uh, because George Bush uh, took the political risk that he did, and it was a great risk, of uh, resorting to military force uh, in order to defeat Saddam Hussein, uh, an international outlaw. It means that in the future, a warning by George Bush will be enough because they will know here is a man when he warns, he has not only the means, but the will to back it up. So by using force now, he may not have to use it in the future. That was Eisenhower's secret. The fact that he was feared because he was a great military commander. Now George Bush has acquired some of that same credibility which he didn't have before because he had not been a commander as had Eisenhower. But now he's been a commander. It's true, Iraq is a small country. Uh, it uh, did not prove to be as difficult as we had, had uh, feared it might be. But the very fact that he demonstrated that leadership capability and that he would resort to force and had the diplomatic skill and the will to use it means that this war was not just a war for the purpose of winning it, but it was a war about peace in the long run. Very good. Thank you very, very, very much.